It's time to get started this morning. Let's take our psalm books to page number 107. No, not one. There's not a friend like the love, lowly Jesus. <clears throat> page number 107 this morning. Good morning to everyone. Page number 107. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, no, not one, no, not one. None else could heal our soul's diseases, no, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our troubles, he will stand today welcome this morning on this brisk morning thankful for the cooler weather in a way amen some of you are like no <laughs> all right heavenly father we're so grateful to be in your house today thank you heavenly father there's no one like you thank you heavenly father you know all about our struggles and all the things that we go through i pray heavenly father lord we'll just continue to run to you and lord because lord we can't fix anything Help us, Heavenly Father, to run to you when we have little problems and bigger problems. Lord, we can't do anything. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord. Be at this, be at this service today. Be at each uh, Bible teacher now. And Lord, be at the singing and specials and the preaching of your word after a while. Be at our pastor today. Encourage him. Strengthen him. And Lord, if there's someone here today that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, oh God, save him today, would you? We thank you, Lord, for how good you've been to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed to your classes today. Leviticus chapter 5 this morning. Leviticus chapter 5. I kind of apologize to you. I am on a different track than what I told you. And I'm going to finish the offerings and then, uh, uh, but we are going to be in the next, I don't know, two or three weeks. Uh, what? Turn on mic. Turn on mic. All righty. Hang on. I'll try to get it. It says it's on. I don't know. Go on the top. Mute. Is that working now? That's what everybody's been hoping for a long time, that it would mute. Mute. Um, I want to finish uh, the, the fifth uh, offering, uh, Le the Levitical offerings that we've been looking at. And um, let's just review a little bit Leviticus there on that. Um, let me just say, I want to kind of open this thing up a little bit this morning. Um, I, I was going to teach and preach uh, a long situation on uh, the second coming of Christ. And uh, pertaining to the rapture, also pertaining to the day of the Lord, the day of Christ. There's a lot, lot in that. I mean, it's huge. And it's and I've got, you know, there's a lot of scriptures. And there's a lot of, uh, the reason I want to be really careful about it, a lot of disagreements about that. 
as far as time or sequence, so forth like that. And it's not a light issue. I've seen somebody put something on Facebook here not too long ago about, oh, we need to quit arguing over uh, translations and when the Lord's coming back, this, that, and the other, and focus on Jesus. That sounds real good. But if you don't have a Bible, you don't have a foundation for the faith. And you can just wander into another Jesus. That, that, may sound, that sounds pretty pious, but it's not, it's not right. And uh, it's, that's part of the way Satan wants to get us off where we just have another Jesus of our own making. But anyway, uh, having said that, we will get into that. In fact, I've got all kinds of stuff with me. and I, I got studying so deep that one thing leads to another. But I am going to throw something out to you to study. And even those, and by the way, those online, we're glad you're with us. Had, I don't know, three or four or five notes and cards over there, letters, just people thanking the church for putting its services online. We thank you for listening. Uh, I want to throw something out if you want to study it out. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, there's the phrase, Day of the Lord. It is a very, very prominent phrase in Scripture, and it has to do with uh, the tribulation period uh, and the thousand year reign. Okay. Now second Peter chapter three says a day is a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. And we know that if you look back from creation to now, we're about 6,000 years of human history in creation. There's a, uh, kind of a relationship to the seventh day of rest, which fits the, would fit the, uh, uh, millennial reign thousand year uh, <clears throat> so you have this day of the Lord and there's some debate about what it all it encompasses, the time period that it encompasses. The real struggle to me is not the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord to me is, is pretty evident just by the context of what it says. There, there's one that throws me off. And I'm just, I'm just going to take off here this morning. All right. And we'll get down to this thing. Kind of tell you where I'm at. Here, and the reason I say it, I want you to study it. I want you to look at it. You know, I'm not a know-it-all. I don't know everything. And I'll tell you about eschatology. Don't think anybody knows it all because they don't. Amen. And I guarantee you can, you can be going 20 years and all of a sudden you realize, you know what, that's not consistent with Scripture. And, and you just, you've got to be not open to Internet, yeah. Facebook clips, <laughs> but open to the Word of God. Amen. Be really, really careful about eschatology, which means the end times, about listening to stuff online. There's so much crazy stuff out there. It's, it, and, and if you're not careful, it'll sound real good and it sounds real slick, but it's, not, it's what they're not telling you. For instance, let me give you this one. When we say the day of the Lord, as revealed in the Old Testament, it's just pretty clear. It talks about a day of gloom, a day of darkness, a day of trouble. And it's, it leads to the time of Jacob's trouble, the, 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 great, the tribulation period. But also the time, the day of the Lord, his reign upon this earth, his, his reigning, okay, for a thousand years, which will be after the tribulation. But when you go to Second Peter chapter 3, he talks about the day of the Lord. And guess what he says? It's when the earth melts. So it must extend beyond the millennial reign into the uh, melting of the earth and the new heaven and the new earth. So now I've extended my view of the day of the Lord clear through to the new heaven and new earth because of what Second Peter says. Now here's the here's the one I want you to throw at, and we're gonna we're not and I say all this because I'm I was going to have a complete I almost put on Facebook. We're gonna start Sunday uh, in morning Sunday school class. We're gonna go through that, and the message is gonna be three parts in one day: Sunday school, preaching hour, and Sunday night, because it's it's that bigger, bigger. I mean, it just is. And before I got done, I just, I, I literally, I, I wrestled last night. I wrestled, I didn't have peace. And so by the time about uh, eight o'clock this morning, I finally, the Lord gave me peace. I mean, I literally went to my prayer closet, got on my face and said, God, I don't have peace about all this. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I don't care what it is I'm supposed to do as long as you'll guide me Amen. to it. And I couldn't get peace about doing it. So I'm not ready to do that today. But here's what I want to throw at you so you can be studying in the New Testament, there's a phrase, not only day of the Lord, but day of Christ. And the big argument among people who 
you know, are concerned about prophecy, which we all should be to a certain degree. You don't go to seed on it. You'll find out. So we're in First Thessalonians this morning in preaching hour again. You'll find out that God never deals with prophecy without dealing with practicality. Amen. And if you start messing with prophecy without daily practical living Amen. now, you'll get so out there. Yeah, you, you, you'd just be worthless to anybody. God always combines practical Christian living with prophecy in the sense that that's in the future, but now, how to live now till that comes, and how to live in the light of that. <clears throat> in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is a huge, in second, 1 Thessalonians is primarily about the rapture of the church. 2 Thessalonians has to, every chapter in both books mentions the coming of Christ, okay? 2 Thessalonians mentions his second coming down to the earth at the end of the tribulation period, Revelation 19, of which in the Old Testament, there's all kinds of scriptures prophesying about that. And a lot of stuff in the New Testament and Matthew 24 and so forth, a lot of New Testament scriptures. Here's where people are, are and, 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 and I will tell you this, I don't have myself locked in. I, I'm locked in as to sequence, but I'm not locked into ex explanation of some things. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says that that day shall not come except there first be a fall. What day? Day of Christ in verse 2. In verse 3, it said that day shall not come except there first be a falling away and that man of sin be revealed. So what's that telling you? The day of Christ is not going to come until uh, there's a falling away. Now we're seeing that. We're in it. We're in the great falling away. The church, I mean, literally across... I mean, it's, it's here. It's, it's just everywhere. I, I'm not, I, I'll get away from that. And then they said, the man of sin be revealed, the Antichrist, the beast. So, there's a problem with a lot of eschatology teaching right here in that, because a lot of people say the day of Christ is the rapture of the church. That can't be. Can't be. Because if it is, that means the rapture doesn't occur till after either during or at the end of the tribulation, and that ain't the way the Bible teaches at all. But that verse is used by people to prove that the, that the church will not be taken out prior to the tribulation. And so those people believe in what's called a mid-trib rapture or no rapture at all. General resurrection and general judgment. Okay? So that's... And I just said that. And I've got all kinds of scriptures and I want to lay all this out and so forth when I do this, but I'm going ahead and tell you this because I would like to, because the day of Christ is mentioned probably four or five times in the New Testament, more to the church in Corinth than any other church, the day of Christ. Now I'm of opinion that the Holy Spirit, when he says something, he means what he says. I'm going to throw this at you just to think about one of the things that's connected when you read the day of Christ phrase, it's always about seem like rejoicing and happiness and reward for serving the Lord and, and things like that. When you talk about the day of the Lord, it's always judgment. I mean, mm. so here's what I've decided. And you can all study and think that I've decided that the day of Christ and the day of the Lord is the same thing. But it's a different day of Christ for the saved and day of the Lord for the, Amen. For the lost. Yeah. And that the day of Christ uh, begins, uh, so it, I believe it literally begins with the, judge, the judgment seat of Christ. And then will move itself. And, and this time period for, for the saved will be the day of Christ. But for the lost, it'll be the day of the Lord. Now, <laughs> I'm not locked in on that, okay? But I want you to be thinking about that. And if you want to do some study this week, study the phrases in the New Testament, day of Christ, and the context, the chapters, the book that you're in. If you want to go study all the phra uh, phrases of the day of the Lord, do that. Because I'm going to be preaching on that and teaching on that in the coming weeks. And now, let's talk about something. We have... A major situation going on in the Mideast. Yes, this, this is not a little deal. This is not a light deal. That's right. 
Uh, World War II, let's do a little history here this morning concerning, and, and if you got something you want to throw in on this, you're welcome. See, the church around World War I, prior to that time, had a, what's, had a Israel replacement theology, by and large. They just felt like that God was totally done with Israel, and they were scattered, and he was forever done with them. And they knew about the Jewish people, but they knew they were scattered across the world. They didn't have a nation, didn't have a language, didn't have nothing, no sacrifice, nothing. So they just, and, and they fancied themselves that the church would replace Israel as far as the kingdom goes. And that the church was going to be so influential in the world, it was going to bring in the kingdom. And then Jesus could come back and reign over it after we had conquered the world with Christianity. That was the mindset and the theological doctrine taught to most churches in America around the turn of the century. When World War I happened, it shook them. Because, see, they thought they were going to bring it. The church thought they were going to. Uh, uh, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord and, uh, and all that. That song has to do with that theology. Well, the church thinking it's going to bring in the kingdom, going to bring peace, see, for a thousand years. And Jesus come back. And World War I kind of messed that up. So they adjusted their theology a little bit and said, well, that's just kind of a, a pre-run deal. And God had to kind of clean some things up to get you. Know, we had to deal with that, uh, that. Let me just tell you something. Don't ever underestimate the curse and the depravity of man. Don't ever get away from that. Van was just talking to me a while ago about dealing with young people, about uh, learning to accept themselves and being bitter at God because of the way they look or some de defect they might have or whatever. You better deal with that. And you better remember there's a curse and a fall, and all of us are under it. And you know why I ain't good looking? <laughs> it's because I'm under the curse. No, I mean, I'm just saying, you've got, to learn, you've got to learn to accept yourself in the middle of a cursed, wicked, sin-cursed world. You just do. And if you don't, if you look at Hollywood and this world and what they tell you you're supposed to look like and act like and be, you'll never be it. And they're not either. It's all play act. And, and you better be happy with yourself. Well, what I'm saying is we live in a depraved, cursed world. So, so they started to shift a little bit. Well, World War II come, but World War II come, and it blew all that theology out of the water bad because it's like, man, alive. We're not bringing peace. The world's going crazy. Two world wars within 25 years of each other. And then something really wild happened. During World War II, you had the Holocaust. And that was the killing of over 6 million Jewish people and an intense hatred for Jewish people that arose up. And man, it was, it was like a volcano that had been building across Europe, around the world, and it exploded through Hitler. And it did something in the end. Uh, see, FDR wouldn't even let Jews come in the United States during that time. I don't know how many people knows that. He turned ships away. He, that were with Jewish people trying to flee Hitler. Okay? So, the Jewish people, the world became conscious of the Jewish people's, the hatred of Jewish people by the world. And so, out of that came what's called the Belfort Declaration and the establishment of a Jewish homeland back in the land of Israel that God had given them. And Britain had control of that land after World War I. And so Britain uh, influenced United Nations to vote to partition Palestine, what they called it, Israel. And so the Jewish people had a homeland for the first time since their dispersion back 2,000 years ago. And all of a sudden, here's this people that ever all the American theologians and German theologians and England theologians said would never be again. All of a sudden, uh-oh, God meant what he said. He said, I'm going to regather them from the north and the south and the east and the west. And I'm going to bring them back into my land. And, and they saw this doing it. And then all of a sudden, watch this, in 1948, after World War II in 1945, the, the nation was literally established the nation of Israel, our president was the first, we were the first nation on the face of the earth to recognize them as a nation. Jewish people began to pour back into Israel. Now, since that time, the day that they declared their independence, just like we did from England, 
Every Muslim nation around them declared war on them. It's called the Independence War of 1948. It's not taught. It's, your kids will not learn this in a public school. I'm sorry. They will not learn it. And they will learn nothing about what's really going on. I'm just, it's sad. Because without this, you know, you, you just, you're just wandering and groping in the darkness of human history. You'd have no, no clue what's happening. And so anyway, they had the War of Independence. And Israel won the War of Independence against all those Muslim nations. Then in 1956, Nassar out of Egypt, he attacked them again. And again, the Jewish people won their war. In 1967, they were again attacked by the Muslim nations and they won the six day war. That was in 1970, uh, see, 1973, wasn't it? Yom Kippur War. The 67, the 67 war was the six day war. In 1973, now here's where I'm coming to with this. In 1973, was the Yom Kippur War. How many remembers the feast that I've taught on here a while back? The Feast of Atonement was what the Jewish people were observing last Saturday when they were attacked. They were attacked on the very same day that they were attacked in 1973 in the Yom Kippur War. What the Muslims know is that the Jewish people on Yom Kippur, which is the Feast of the Atonement, it's a day of, of repentance and mourning and a day of you know, quieting before the Lord and, and recognizing their sinfulness and so forth. And there's, you know, a draw near the Lord for the religious Jews. The whole country shuts down over there. Yeah. Yeah. Everything shuts down. Yeah. And how many knows that Israel got caught again? Yeah. They got caught again. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they were depending too much on their, watch this, listen to me, Technology. Instead of people on the ground. That's a nice idea that computers is going to save you. But if somebody shuts the computers down. Did, how many of you know that the Hamas shot down with drones the towers that would tell, was, would tell the Israeli people what's going on on the fences. That's the first thing they did with drones. Knocked their communication towers out along that fence. And then they, they penetrated the fence in 26 different locations. So you have Israel being attacked on the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement, it speaks of the tribulation period. And you say, Reggie, what do you think is going on? I think, I think Hitler was a dress rehearsal. And I think we're really close. Now, I don't know that. Boy, oh boy, let me tell you something we've got now that we didn't have in 1973 and 1948 and 1945. We did not have the lot as it was in the days of lot phenomenon. We did not have lot, the, the days of lot phenomenon that Jesus said would be when he came back is the extreme perversion of sexuality and perversion in the world. And that is here. Our president last night spoke to the Human Rights Commission gathering and all he did all he did in that speech was brag that America was the bastion for queers and sodomites and transgenders for the world that we are our, our aim and goal as America now is to convince the world to be tolerant of sodomites but he used different words I just listen to him before I come to church today sickest thing you've nearly ever heard in your life but that's a phenomenon that we have now that we did not have in 1973, 1948, 1945. And I don't pretend to know when the Lord's coming, but I'm going to tell you something right now. The reason I'm going to teach and preach on that is because things are winding down. I mean, it's, it's winding down. And it, it could be 100 years, 200 years. It could be 10 minutes. I don't know. But I'll tell you right now, I don't know what's left much of what the Bible says that needs to happen. Do you, Brother Carr? That needs to happen before the Lord, you know, comes back and think the stage is being set. Yeah, yeah. I'll throw you a wild one. I wished I had time to do this here this morning, but the left, let's just call the left in, in America, the progressive liberal wing of America. Yeah. Do you watch what happened this week with that bunch? They joined up with the Muslim Hamas supporters in America. And they're the ones having all these protests in these cities, uh, New York and Seattle and 
wherever other places, especially on the universities of America. Did you know that those people have absolutely nothing in common? Muslims and the left of America have zero in common. I mean, I could take you through a 10 point list of whether, how are Muslims on death penalty? They believe in it. Left. Absolutely not. Muslims on queers. They'll throw you over the building. Left. All for it. Every issue, every cultural and religious issue there is, they disagree on it vehemently. And yet they're out in the streets together this week. What's the issue? A satanic inspired hatred of the nation of Israel and Jewish people. And that's what you're going to see. They're going to bring all these opposing groups together and one major cause. And that's when you're going to see the fireworks out at glory land. Boy, I'll tell you what. I am, I, it makes doodaddies run up, and I'm not a doodaddy guy, okay? <laughs> I don't care how big your doodaddies are, the just shall live by faith. Amen. But when I think about the fact that I know what's going to happen, yeah. that I know from this book what's going to happen, and that this book is, has told us the news ahead of time, Amen. and I think about the day when Jesus Christ was lightning as lightning in flaming fire comes and takes vengeance upon this earth, upon all this garbage. That's exciting. That's exciting. Somebody had a hand up somewhere. Yes. But you also got the BLM movement oh, that yeah. is joining it as well. Yeah. But the Bible says they will hate you for my name's sake. Yep. We're, we're getting to where Jews are hated and the true Christians are hated. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's a windup of it. You know, Harvard, Oh, okay. uh, all your liberal schools uh, to the point, Reg, that it's not when it's going to happen. It, it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And we're, yes, things are just coming together like this right here. Let me give you one thing when you're studying real big. Always w rightly divide the word of truth. Yes, sir. And that one of the biggest issues, how people get off on this, they do not keep Israel separated from the church. Israel is not the church and the church is not Israel and they're two distinctly separate things in the Bible and God deals with them separately. In fact, boy, boy, I'm not doing very good. Hey, uh, let's just do have some fun because we're going to re-go over this. But okay, uh, Joel, would you put up 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 through 17? I don't know where we're going. We just have a good time. Amen. But, but, Brett, did you have a hand up? I'm yeah. sorry. So... The, the Muslim, so I was headed over to Vi one time and, and I was sitting beside a Muslim cleric on the airplane and we were talking and he was explaining to me that over 90% of the men, Muslim men, are queer. Really? That, that they have homosexual tendencies because for them it's not considered, it's considered fun. To them. It's to them. Okay? It's not the the uh, the women are for childbearing, men are for fun. And if you watch them over there, like when you pull into the airport, they're all the men are together. And the women are separate with the kids. Why did they throw the queers off the building? And, and totally and different because it's not okay to be open about it. It's a it's a facade. Mm -hmm. Right? Wow. And, yeah. the, the, but the hatred for Israel over there is real. Oh, um, yeah, when, when we would travel over there, we had to have a separate passport to go into, per, into is, Israel. A second, I've got three American passports. And one was strictly only to go into Israel and, and out. Because if you go into Iraq or Afghanistan or Africa or, or even the Philippines with a, with a stamp in your passport that is Israeli, they will put you in jail. Wow. They will. That's it's that they, serious. That's how bad they hate them. Yeah. And, and don't. They've, been, they've <coughs> infiltrated their borders. That is another way that they were able to sneak up on those people. Okay? Because they were infiltrating inside their borders just like our southern borders southern border, yeah okay. i mean and uh, if the thing that people don't understand about terrorism if if 2500 kids 
can come into our border a day from Mexico, what makes you think the terrorists can't? Yeah, I mean, that's just like... They're here. Yeah, they're, yeah. I, I, they, I will tell you that I think... Here's, here's the they, mindset behind that. It, it, the, the globalist... See, the Antichrist is going to be a globalist. He will do away with the concept of nations. In America's universities right now, and even a lot of churches, they're, they're pushing to not be nationalistic. And this is why, as you say, what's wrong with these people? Why don't they have a problem with people coming across the borders? Because they're globalist. <clears throat> Behind that globalism is the belief that capitalism is a crime against humanity. That free enterprise is a crime against humanity. And that Western nations have kept other nations down under the thumb. And if you sit around these universities listening to this garbage, you'll start believing that stuff. But then you don't always think this, why do they want to come here? Why, why would they risk their life to get in here? Because of what this nation offers in the way of freedom. And you can say, you can say how bad you want to about America, but I think there's more freedom here and more opportunity than any place on the face of this earth, as generally speaking. Be really wary of anybody who teaches you globalism. <clears throat> God ordained nations. Now, will Jesus rule over the world? Yes. But that doesn't mean there's not nations. And he created nations. He created uh, the nation of Israel. He created nations in, in the Old Testament. You can read them. So, but be, uh, here's what I'm going to go back again and say. Be really, really careful about what you're hearing. Because you're, a lot of the news media are going to form, are going to carve out Hamas to be the victim. They always do that. News media is vehemently, by and large, some, some of them are not. But all your liberal, wing, they... Right now, they're, they're being tepid, tepid because they know if they say too much about, and when these babies have been beheaded and all this kind of stuff, they know that ain't going to fly with American people. So they're being real careful how they verbiage stuff. But by and large, they're against Israel. And they will, you watch what I tell you, Israel's going to invade Gaza. And they're going to, there's going to be some atrocities. And then they're going to take those atrocities. They're already doing it. They're already putting pictures of supposedly Israeli bombs falling on people who are fleeing south to get out of Israel. And they're going to make Israel out to be the bad person. <clears throat> now, let me say something to you talking about sodomy and so forth. Israel <clears throat> itself is a hotbed for sodomy. Yeah. Tel Aviv is like San Francisco. Yeah. And there's unbelievable amount of wickedness over there. <clears throat> the last time I was in Israel on a trip over there and stayed in a hotel in Tel Aviv. I believe it was that time of the time before. When you check into a hotel room, right there on your nightstand are advertisements for sodomites, prostitutes, anything you want. Yeah. You just call right there. You just call them right up. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just wide open perversion. So don't, you know, sin is sin. Yeah. Okay. And God doesn't make the Jewish people. He, he said, I didn't, I didn't choose you because you were righteous. I didn't choose you because you were numerically. It, why did God choose? Why did God save you and I grace? And you can't understand it. That's why it's amazing grace. Why am I saved? It's like Ruth said to Boaz. Why have I found grace in thine eyes? You know, it ain't cause I'm so good. I can promise you that brother Don. You know, we were in Israel and we went down below where the temple mount is at. And that is where the Dome of the Rock is, which is the second or third most important Muslim worshiping place. And in the Bible, it talks about there's going to be a rebuilding of the temple. And now with all this going on, and we see the rockets flying every which way, my thoughts are something could destroy the Dome of the Rock. Yeah. Some misguided oh, rocket or something guided rocket by God. But that could be destroyed <laughs> in a heartbeat. And that would, uh, I thought, how are they going to rebuild that? And you, we've seen where they're building the, the furniture for the temple. They're building yeah. this and this and this. And I'm thinking, man, that could very well be something during these times now could create the opportunity for the rebuilding of the temple. Yeah. Uh, let me th throw two or three things at you. Number one, go to Genesis. See, I was way out, ain't I? Is that working? Okay, there you go. Mm. I got to my mind just like that. I ain't joking. <laughs> Genesis 12, 3, just leave that up, or, but you ought to write this down. Genesis chapter 12 is where God makes his covenant with Abraham that he will bless those that bless them and he will curse those that curse them. 
And you may not, you may say, well, I don't have any confidence in the Bible. But if you check, if you check history out, every nation that cursed them, the Jew has walked over his grave. Yes. And he walked over his grave, not because he was so powerful, but because he had the hand of God. And it, it, don't, don't think for minutes, you, you can figure God out. You can't. I mean, he, he's revealed what he wants us to understand, but it, you know, now I'm going to give you something and warn you about something. And some of you may not like this, but I'm just going to tell you because I have a bad feeling about it. There's a guy, I know you're going to mention his name because I don't want you hunting him up. But he's on the internet teaching that the blood of Jesus went down through some cracks in the rocks. And it's down in the earth and all that stuff. Now I don't go for that at all. I won't tell you where the blood of Christ is at. It's on the mercy seat in the true tabernacle in heaven. And they're trying to say, well, it's in both places. Now I don't... I don't <clears throat> just watch that okay just you you may love it i don't even want to look at you and see your head shake no, one way or the other i'm telling you pastor i've got a huge caution light shot when i when i hear that stuff okay okay this is first thessalonians and he first thir 13 and remember that in chapters one two and three he's already mentioned about the coming of the lord and and, and to comfort those people and we'll, we'll be into this here in a couple, three weeks. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw not, even as others which have no hope. He said, I know you're going to sorrow, but I don't want you to sorrow with hope. And he is teaching them now doctrine. For if we believe, believe, didn't say if you were baptized. It said, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's the gospel, right? Amen. The death, burial, and resurrection. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which, look at this phrase, sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. All right? <clears throat> and he's saying this. So when Paul said, for a Christian to be absent from the body is to be what? Present, Present with the Lord. The bodies of Christians who have died, sleep in Jesus, okay, they're, gra they're in the grave. The bodies are in the grave or wherever they may be. But their spirit and soul is with the Lord. And they're coming back with Christ at this resurrection. And then here's what's going to For with this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And that word prevent is an English. It, you say, well, that's why we need new Bibles. No siree. That's one of the sweetest words and there is about the coming of Christ. That comes from a compound word, pre-vent. Now let's back up. Tell me what a vent is. It is a passageway out. It, it, vent means to go up. And it's saying that we which are still alive when Christ comes, we are not going to pre-go before those that are dead in Christ. Look what it says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So those that have died, their bodies are going to be resurrected in a brand new glorified body fashioned as like unto the body of Jesus Christ. So what it said, Philippians chapter 2 and other places, okay? Brand new body fashioned like unto his glorified body. See, your salvation is threefold. When you're saved, you're born of the Spirit. You're a new spirit, you're alive unto God, new creature. <clears throat> your so salvation of your soul is the, I'm going to preach on this morning, on the sanctification work of God after you're saved. In the conforming of your mind to the image of Christ, can, changing your heart, changing your mind, your soul. And that's why it talks about being, you're saved, you're being saved and you will be saved. Okay, but you've been given eternal life. This is the third aspect of your salvation, is the resurrection of the body. A new body, fashioned like the Lord Jesus Christ. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, we which are alive and remain, shall be what? Caught up. To, so here they're, they're going to come up. I mean, my dad, he's down there in that grave. Vault, he's coming up. And I'm going to, and, and then we're going to be translated. We're going to be transformed. Look what it says. We be caught together with the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort another one, on another with these words. We'll be translated. 
That's what happened to Enoch. He was translated. And we'll receive, we won't die to receive our new body. God will just literally, miraculously, instantaneously give us a new glorified body. And we will go up together with those people. All right. Then he says something here. And by the way, get this. If you don't get anything else, why was he tell, why did the Holy Ghost want Paul to tell the Christian people this? Well, if you go back and really look at Thessalonians, they'd been, <clears throat> oh my goodness, Reggie, you're running wild. They had been being, getting a lot of garbage. They were being told a lot of stuff. In fact, he tells you it was in word, it was in spirit, and it was a letter. They were getting stuff was coming in. Paul's writing them to straighten all this stuff out. And here's why. Because these people were absolutely shook up. They were being told that Jesus had already come, that they had the whole deal. And like all their hope was crashed. And Paul said, no, no, don't believe these lies and these false wolves coming in telling you all the garbage. <clears throat> And here's what he said. He said, there's no more comforting passage of scripture in the Bible than that hardly. For both the dead and the living. Yeah. This is what he said. And so shall we what? Ever, ever be with the Lord. Amen. There'll never be a time past that where what we will not be with Christ. Amen. Physically and literally. Then he finishes out the chapter by saying what? Wherefore comfort one another with these words. That ought to bring, it brings me comfort. I hope it does you. I'm telling you, he's coming. And I'm, I'm going to get rid of this old sin cursed body. And I'll just be honest with you. I don't think you and I can even start to comprehend what it means to have a new glorified body. That has, does not have the curse of sin upon it. Death can't hit anymore. Now, I want you to go to 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 2. Okay, Second Thessalonians chapter two. So here's cha here's cha here's the First Thessalonians, which refers to the first aspect. And by the way, where did when we go when you read that? Where did we meet Jesus? In the, in the air, coming with clouds, meet him in the air. In that one there, we meet him in the air. That never says he comes back to the earth right there. No, we meet him in the air. That's what it says. Yeah. Everybody got that? <laughs> now watch this one here. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, which I believe is referring back to 1 Corinthians 4, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word. Watch this. He said, they're shaking your mind up. Yep. This is why I tell you, be careful about what you're watching on the Internet, Amen. Facebook. Your mind will get shook. Yeah. Be not shaken in mind or be troubled. Ne watch this. Neither by spirit. Why do you put that in? Because there can be a spirit. There are unseen powers that can mess you up. A satanic spirit go to troubling you. Nor by word, somebody comes in and says something contrary to scripture. Nor by letter. Evidently, these people had even received, quote, supposedly scriptures refuting what Paul had already said. He said, you, I don't, Paul said, I don't care. You know what he says in another past scripture? He said, I don't care if it's an angel. Shows up. You don't believe it. If it's contrary to the Bible, you don't believe it. And he said, nor as letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So now here's that phrase, day of Christ. But here's what I want you to get to. Let no man deceive you, but he means for that day shall not come, that day of Christ, except there come a fallen away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. There's two titles of the Antichrist. <laughs> Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, Don, Don just for a little bit here, that makes me think that the temple will be rebuilt, but I'm not sure just in what location or how that's going to happen. Because the Bible teaches that the Antichrist is going to set in the temple. Yeah. Sure. Showing himself, he's got, remember you not that when I was with you, I told these things. And now you uh, know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. I'm not going to get into the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now here it comes, number eight. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. <clears throat> That's a different event. Yes, totally. Than chapter 4 verse number 4. Chapter 4 is a catching away of the church. Both of the dead and the, the, dead and the living saints. And it's a meeting of him in the air. 
But in 2 Thessalonians, you're seeing the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is, this is Revelation 19, verse 11 through 16. This is Matthew chapter 24, where he says, as the lightning cometh from so forth. This, this, this event right here is all through the Old Testament. The, the Jewish people reading their Bibles in the Old Testament saw this. What they, they, how many knows why they didn't see 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? It's a mystery. It wasn't revealed to the prophets. Paul tells you. Wasn't revealed to anybody except Paul when he came. And they, they didn't see the church. It was embedded in there in, in foreshadow ties, but the doctrine was the only thing they could see. God given two things. He, saw, he let them see a suffering Savior and a reigning Savior. They refused to look at the suffering Savior. They didn't like that one. They wanted the reigning Savior. <clears throat> now this gets into a lot of stuff. Because the Bible said that the Antichrist, this man of sin, will deceive the very elect if it were possible. Yeah. And I'm so glad the Holy Ghost put it in there if it were possible. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to give you something. Hang on this. Both Israel and the church saints are called elect. So don't let anybody trick you up with the, with the term elect. Okay, keep Israel and the church separate. Let me just tell you something. When that first Thessalonians chapter 4 gets done, the church is out of here. Let me give you some. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, just, I'm just messing this up so bad. I'm going to throw something at you. I do not believe for a, a fiber or one blood cell in my whole being that the church is going to go through the tribulation or any part of it. Because there's no basis for it. There's a couple of places where it, it but um, in the book of Revelation, divided in three sections chapter one first section chapter two and three second section chapter four through 22 third section things that are the things that have been are and shall be chapter one verse 19 is the outline verse of the book after chapter three you never read the word church in the book of revelation till chapter 22 till everything's over and all it says is this is written to the churches so you could know what's going to happen. If anybody tries to tell you the church is going through the tribulation, ask them, where are they at in there? Yeah. They're not in there. Right. In fact, chapter 4, after chapter 2 and 3, when he writes those letters to the seven churches, he gives all the language of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, 17, and the language of Jesus Christ promises to, to take his people out. Voice, door, trump, shout, it's all there. And then the scenes up in heaven. You know what he's doing? He's doing exactly what he said he would do in the first chapter, signifying, telling you by sign. All right. Now, who do you... So the, the tribulation starts in Revelation chapter 6. Clear as a bell. There's a false Christ coming on a white horse. And people's going to accept him. Jesus told them in, in, in the in Gospels, he said, I come, you won't receive me, but one come in my name, you'll, you'll receive him. Yeah. 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 And the Antichrist is going to come on a white horse, Revelation chapter 6. And Revelation chapter 6 to 18 is your tribulation period. The church is never mentioned in that, one, not one time, zero time in that entire thing. Why? Because the church is gone. But who is mentioned? Twice in that tribulation period, 144,000 Jewish people are mentioned in there, and it's all about Israel. Chapter 12, right smack in the midst of it, will take you straight back to Genesis with uh, Joseph. In, remember, remember his dream? The sun, the moon, the stars? Did you know the Bible tells you who that is? That takes you straight back to Joseph's vision. You know what that tells me? That God pre-wrote the Bible before you ever saw it in print. God is not up there going, oh, my land, this is getting out of hand. Yeah. No, no, it's just going to plan. Amen? Amen. It's just rolling down. I, I'm so wound up and wild, I don't shut up. we got a few minutes left. <clears throat> Let's go to Leviticus chapter 5. <laughs> I want to finish these offerings. I, I didn't mean to. But I'm going to tell you this. I want you to get uh, if, study, you know, get your 52 outline to study the rapture and so forth like that. Now, let me just tell you something. When somebody disagrees with me, they're not a bad person. Okay, now if you start hammering me and you start trying to usurp my authority here at this church, we're probably not going to get along very good, okay? Amen. If you don't believe what I believe, I, I, you have a privilege to do that. I'm not going to hate you for not doing that, but I'm not going to allow a bunch of stuff come in here that, that's going to keep everybody mixed up and worried. And I'm not going to let happen 
what Paul was preventing happening in the book and to the church at Thessalonica. Amen. They were shaken. They were troubled. They were bothered. By, everybody was telling them all this stuff and making them think that, man, live, we missed the coming of Christ. And we thought we were saved. Right. It's not good. God said, I want you comforted. You know what you ought to be? Don't set the news. Don't watch that. Oh, my land. Oh, my land. No, no. Be comforted. Be comforted. Hey, it's all coming out fine. The fact of it is, I'm feeling just a little bit happy. <laughs> yes. Pastor, can you comment just real quick on uh, the Catholic Church says that woman is Mary, the Queen of Heaven. Mm -hmm. it's, I don't know what chapter it's in. Just. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Be, they could say, well, see, there's the church, you know, in yeah, the well, so. Okay, to, to answer that question, you've got to go back. The Queen of Heaven is in the book of Jeremiah. Yeah. She was a pagan yeah. goddess, okay? And they literally had the same things that the Catholic Church uses. The You know, the we could go into Christmas trees. I mean, I'll just tell you, Christmas trees is there, whether you like it or not. And I'm and, and I'm not against you having a Christmas tree at your house. You want to have a, you know, you don't you don't have to. Everything that is in the world, you don't have to make it out to its worst case scenario, okay? But if you want to be honest about it, there there is literally it describes a Christmas tree there in in the passage of scripture. Queen of Heaven was, of course, the pagan goddess way back then, when uh, Constantine forced uh, his people and soldiers to become Christians. Then they legalized the Christian church. And it became pagan. So they brought the pagan practices into the church in the first three centuries. And that's where the Catholic Church did. So they took the Queen of Heaven from their pagan practices, took and applied her to Mary. And then they called, began to call Mary the Queen of Heaven. Which was absolutely, anybody that reads their Bible, that's why they don't want them to read the Bible. Because if you was a good Catholic, you say, read my Bible. And oh my land, they're calling Mary the Queen of Heaven. She's a pagan goddess. Yeah. And you take that to your priest and see what happens. Yeah. Just like, I mean, I'm, I'm serious with you. It's so sad. But what they did, they embedded all these paganistic practices. Easter. Okay. That's why your Acts chapter 12 verse 4 says Easter. Because it was a pagan holiday that, th that they were talking about. It wasn't the Passover. Amen. Passover was already done. It was Easter, which was a which was both the the Christians were celebrating, Jewish were celebrating Passover, but the pagans were celebrating Ishtar, which is connected to all those pagan religions. So now, <clears throat> I know where you're really going with this. The great whore, right? Revelation, probably. Yeah, I'm not sure what chapter it is. But okay. I know the Catholic Church teaches that's Mary, and that would put the church in the tribulation if it is. Yeah, but it's not Mary. I mean, I don't know how they do that. They just, I don't, I don't know how you could, that's like trying to fit a, a round block, a whole a deal into a square block. It just, how's that fit? Where do they get that at, you know? But see, the Catholic Church's eschatology is that this is all past. There's, there, the, the, the church literally believes that Christ has nothing to do with righteousness on the earth, that they're going to bring in righteousness by conquering the world. That's what the Crusades was all about. Yeah. Forcing people to come under the heel of the Pope and then we'll have peace because he'll rule yep. That's why he's called the vicar of Christ It is a you're exactly right it is a warp by the way I've always said that the the theology of replacement replacement theology really got hatched out of the Catholic Church That it came into your Protestant uh, seminaries Yeah Oh, yeah. That's why you always see the Pope. Hey, how many knows that the Pope and Hitler had a conquer dad? Yeah, they, they had an agreement. We won't bother you. You don't bother us. You just you take care of the Catholics, but you can you do what you want to to the Jewish people. Why? Because they did not see them as God's people. Because if they ever embrace the Jewish people as God's people in the Abrahamic covenant, all their theology goes blowing out the back door. So they cannot abide that. We're getting into some really wild stuff here this morning. <laughs> I don't know how many know that. Yes. Hey, Rich, I just wanted to say a lot of times people mix up the tribulation with man's wrath. There's yeah. a time when the church has exactly. man's wrath, but it won't be tribulation. And, and people mix it up and they tell people, you're going to be in a tribulation, but we got a man's wrath coming against Christianity, but not yeah. tribulation. By the way, 
the first century church, folks, listen, and th up to the third century and a little past, yeah. they were thrown to lions. Yeah. Yeah. They were burned at the stake, yeah. even up into the 15th century. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, young man, how are you? Good to see you. They were thrown to lions. We don't have a clue. What was Paul dealing with? With the first? We're going to get in this just a few minutes when I start preaching on uh, third. He's going to talk to them about their afflictions and their persecutions and their tribulations. Yeah. And he's going to try to comfort them. This is, you know what he's telling them? Exactly what you're talking. Man. He said, this is man's wrath. Not God. It is a totally different thing than God's wrath. Let me just tell you something. God can make stars fall from heaven. God can turn the moon, moon off. God can turn the sun off. God can turn the water into blood. God can make fire come down. You read the book of Revelation, you will read from 6 to 18, you will read about God's wrath. Yeah. Totally different thing than man's wrath. I'll give this to you. What did Jesus tell them? Luke 12, 5. Fear not them that can kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. Amen. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast both soul and body in hell. Amen. Man can only, he can kill you, and, and he may do that, may take five hours to kill you. Amen. And it's terrible. Yes. But that's still man's wrath. Amen. It is not God's wrath. The tribulation is God's wrath upon an unbelieving world and a world that hates his people. Amen. By the way, do you know what God said about Israel? He said, they're the apple of his eye. And he said, whoever toucheth them, toucheth the apple of my eye. Well, we have blown out the window, my Sunday school class. It's all your fault. <laughs> Boy, I tell you something. Now, listen, listen to me. I believe the Lord's coming back. Yeah. And, and, you know, but, uh, but until he does, I, I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to mill logs and, you know, drink my coffee. And, sure. and, and I'm going to study my Bible and try to serve the Lord. But I'm going to have one ear cocked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen. I'm going to walk out my house in the morning and I'm going to look up. But I'm going to go on to work. And that's what Thessalonians is really all about. Yes, yes, he's coming. But until he does, here's how you need to live. And don't live in fear. Yeah. Don't live in worry. I'm telling you things to comfort you. It's okay. I'm going to tell you something right now. If God can't take care of me through all the troubles of this world, how could he take care of me eternally? Amen. We got a great big God. Amen. Well, it's 1043 and we didn't get so I, I guess I don't know what we'll try to do this some other time. I was I, I wanted to finish up the offerings and there's some really good stuff in it because he moves out of the judicial salvation that Christ provided in the picture in these offerings to the practical application. All right. What what after you have received Christ's offering for your sin and been saved? Now what? This is the big thing that bothers me about Christianity America right now. Everybody wants to take the offering, believe on the cross and the redemption, but then God leave me alone till I need you when I die. Because I'm going to go live like I want. And that is not taught in the Bible. That's totally contrary to what the scripture teaches. Well, whew, anybody got anything else? Yeah. You mentioned not going online and all this stuff. The, I talk to people a lot about the Bible. I mean, no, no, no not totally, but be careful right. when you're online. Yeah. We get this dumb idea that we can handle it. Yeah. It's not true. The more stupid stuff you listen to, the more stupid you're going to be. And Amen. And everybody else. Right. Amen. you got to stick to the book. I'll tell you what. I, I, I would, if there's something that I could pound in the people of this church is, check what I'm preaching against the Bible. Amen. I am not scared for you to do that. And if I see that I'm wrong, I'll just back up and say, you know what? I'm going to look at that again. Amen. I, I'm, I don't want to be wrong. I'm not God, I, you know, and I'm just learning like everybody else. But I welcome anyone to say, well, Reggie, what about this? Reggie, what about this? And uh, the Bible said that the believers in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things be so. Now, is there an epistle to the Berean church? No. Why? They searched the scriptures. <laughs> They weren't, they weren't going, oh, my land. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, it's just, it's wonderful. The Bible is so neat, amen. amen. It's just so neat. And, uh, and I, I tell you what, I, yeah, am I excited about Jesus coming back? Sure. But I'm not all like, uh, because I'm going to tell you something. If he don't save me, he's lied. I, you wouldn't believe how many times I've just bowed my head or nailed out where I'm working. 
maybe by myself and just the devil telling me you're not saved you wouldn't act that way how many done anything this week that a saved person ought not do and you know, and I, you know what I always come back to God all I have is your word and Lord, I don't trust my own righteousness. That never did save me, never will save me. Lord, I'm just trusting what Jesus did. If you're listening to me today or you're here, I encourage you, sit for, out there in your seat. You come, I don't care what you do, go outside church, <laughs> walk around the ball field, but get it settled with God Amen. that you're going to trust his son as your savior. And that alone. Because I tell you what, he's our, he's our only hope. And if God's lied to us, we're all in trouble. But God ain't lied to nobody. Aren't you glad it's impossible for God to lie? Amen. Boy, boy, let's stand together. <clears throat> we praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. say to you that one of the benefits of studying the second coming of Christ, it'll kind of revive you. Kind of, now how many well, before we dismiss, I want to make sure did everybody understand that there was two different events that God describes, one in 1 Thessalonians one in 2 Thessalonians, they're totally different things. One of them is when he comes after the church, the other is when he comes back in power and glory to destroy the Antichrist and his armies and to set up his rule. To totally different things. Alright. Lord, we thank you. I pray, God, I've not said anything. Lord, I pray if I've said something wrong that disagrees with your word, that you'll strike it from these people's minds and that it would not hinder nor hurt their walk with you. Lord, that which we have said and what with the scriptures that we've looked together at, I pray, God, that it would give us comfort to know, Lord, that you do not want us dreading the coming. You want us to look forward to it. Lord, help us not to be shaken in mind or troubled by word or by spirit or by letter. Lord, we thank you, God, that your promises are true. So, Lord, help us to rest today in the sure promises of Almighty God. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word, for preserving your word, so that we could have it in front of us, Lord, and be able to read it, rightly divide it, and apply it to our lives. God, I pray today, save, Lord, those who may be lost in this building. Lord, don't let them get out of here without trusting Christ as their Savior. Tear down every lie and every excuse and every hesitation that Satan may throw at them. And by the power of your sweet Holy Spirit, bring them to repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray as John said at the end of the book of Revelation, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, let's get a songbook and sing to the king. Come on, help sing. <laughs>